First and foremost, I just have to say this is such a surreal experience. Um, being able to talk about photography, um, especially the fact that I didn't, I didn't get to go to art school or you know the high school I went to at the time it was a Thomas Edison vocational school and I had a computer repair class. And the first day of computer repair, the teacher told me that it was cheaper to buy a new computer. So um, <laughs> it was uh, it was been a struggle, but you know I think there's been four principles in my life that it's been paramount for me to uh, really experience and take my time to understand. And the only way that I you know, know, the experience, know these experiences is because uh, I've been really cool with my family and really close with my friends, and my friends became my family. So the first principle is to do chasing immortality. Um, and what I mean by chasing immortality is before my love of video games, before my love of anime, basketball, hip hop, sneakers, and pretty much every single nerdy thing, um, I've always loved my family, and I love hanging out with my family and chilling with them. A lot of my family is here in the building. My aunt is recording me. This is really embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but I've always, especially coming from Brooklyn and moving to Queens, um, we lived in Rosedale, and that's where all my cousins used to come hang, hang out at our house. And then we would just you know, play Nintendo 64 all day. We'd be wrestling, you know, and just really enjoying each other's company. And the way that we really celebrated these moments is by taking family photos. Um, and before there was an Instagram, before, before, before there was a Tumblr, um, we had to go to like Woolworths or Rite Aid, like pharmacies, to pick up Kodak envelopes and go through disposable photos for hours. And it will be photos like this. Um, me and Mom Dukes has always been really tight. Mom Dukes is in the building. Brownsville never ran, never will. Um, and then me and my mom has always been pretty much doing the same thing. Um, I've probably watched way more Lifetime movies than I can count. Um, but, you know, that's why me and my mom are really cool. And to this day, me and my mom, you know, still get down and dance. I don't know who took this photo, but it's very artsy. And me and my mom still are the same exact way. You can ask her yourself when you see her later. Um, and then moments like, <laughs> I, know that, I know you're going to love this one, Lauren. Um, moments like this is, is honestly, they're, they're priceless. They're, uh, Lauren is ha obviously having a great time. That's my sister. Um, I don't, my dad is having a good old time, and I don't know who I'm looking at in the first place in that photo. Um, but my mom took this photo, so you could tell it was really well composed because, you know, she's really well composed. And it was just really important that we was always together with these moments, especially being a black family uh, from, Brooklyn, um, from Brooklyn, New York, and Disney World, like in the 90s. It's, it's, it was nothing too crazy, but it's still, um, it was just still really impressive uh, to be like that with our family. And, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you have friends um, I have best friends like Dijon and Demray that I've been cool with since we've been 12 years old. Um, I'm 33 right now, black don't crack. Um, <laughs> you know, but me and Dijon have been you know, pretty much thick as thieves ever since we've been younger. And this is the, on the day of our prom that I took this photo and we were definitely underage and we didn't drink that bottle of Alizé, but you know, Dijon <laughs> was definitely holding it, you know, he was holding it down for us. Um, <laughs> But I think the, what was really important that was happening um, through all these family photos that I really started to cherish and really embrace was that I really got connected to the stories and to the memories of the timelessness of these moments because life is really fragile and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs that happened in my life and with our family that these moments like these became ever more important to myself and, and to my family. So one of the things I started to notice all the time is that if anybody knows my dad, um, he was working all the time. Um, he's always doing something, and clearly, uh, you know, we were just in the backyard digging a hole um, for my basketball court. And I don't know how, why I have one shoe on to this day. Mom, why do I have one shoe on? Um, but like, this is just the essence. Like, I always wanted to be with my pops, and my my dad was a you know a really hard worker, and um, I just idolized him. And without knowing that, that became the subtext of my life of trying to figure out. Um, how do I be like my dad and you know love everything that he uh, that he was about and what he was doing? Um, but that leads to my next point, which is precise persistence. And with precise persistence, what I mean by that is I've had to figure out um, what would drive me for the rest of my life. Um, my dad was um, an electrician, a master's electrician for 35 years. He would definitely let you know that every single day. Um, and then he also was a he ran his own business, which was Irby Electric. Um, and from a young age, I've always was just obsessed with the fact that, like, you know, this is my dad. He was an electrician. He was in control of his own destiny. Um, how can I figure out to be like him? Um, and at the same time, he made sure to let everybody know that I was going to be an electrician, too. So I was on electrical sites from a young age. Like, you can ask my mom, um, pulling wire every single day, playing with sheetrock. And the more I started to do, to do this, I started to notice that I really don't like being an electrician like that. Um, but my dad loved it. Like, you could see it in his eyes, and like, he just was obsessed with you know, everything that came along with it. So 
I started off to really try to figure out, like, if my father loved being an electrician so much, like, I need to, you know, figure out what I love to do as well, too. So um, the first step in my career of, you know, making money and doing my thing was to work at McDonald's. Um, and not only did I work at McDonald's, I started to work at Sears, I worked at Express, I worked at a newspaper route, and at the same time, I still was working with my dad all throughout my teenage years. But then something happened in my life which really made me have to reevaluate everything and, and maybe take a step back. Um, I used to work at this, uh, this mall in Queens called Green Acres Mall, and at Green Acres Mall, yeah, Dijon remembers Green Acres, you know, we was out there heavy in Sears, you know, catch us in the aerobic session. Um, <laughs> Um, but when we was working at the mall, I was really cheap back then, and I decided, like, you know, I could just walk home because it wouldn't be th uh, too bad. And I still remember the day um, that someone asked me, do I want to get in the car with them to take a cheap ride home? I was like, nah, I got two legs. I'm good. Um, so I started to walk home, and I started to notice that these two guys were following me. And I didn't think too much of it at the same time because I was 18 years old. I was really confident and cocky. I just graduated high school. Um, I had a, the U2 edition iPod, which is black and red. I was like, you can't tell me nothing. You know, I was, I was doing my thing. <laughs> Um, I started to, the closer I started to get to home, I started to notice that the guys were following me. And I, you know, I don't want to you know, assume that these dudes are going to do anything. I just kept on minding my business. Um, all of a sudden, um, I got hit in the back of the head with a sock full of rocks. Um, and then the, another two dudes came out of nowhere and hit me with a sock full of, a sock full of rocks on the side of my face. Um, they continued to jump me. Um, they completely shattered my cheekbones. Um, I had to eventually break away and get away from them. And, had to call my parents and stuff like that. I looked like Kanye West and Through the Wire. Um, but I ended up having to get uh, facial, re re facial reconstruction surgery. I had to get three metal plates in my face, and my lip is still partially numb to this day. And um, I was around 18 years old, like I was saying, and that was really tough for me to, at the time because um, I almost died. Uh, the doctor said if I got hit a little bit closer to my temple, I would have been dead. So I, it took my family and my friends to really bring me back to the place where I felt like, you know, comfortable to be in a space to even, you know, just be to live and, you know, be comfortable. So um, I started to get back into the work field and I finally got back into the work field. And the first job I got was a custodian. Um, then after the custodian job, I was like, damn, this really sucks, too. So I need to <laughs> or need to really find I need to figure this out. I need to be persistent. I need to be like my dad and, you know, find something that I love to do. And then I decided to get a job at GameStop because obviously I love video games. So like, this cannot be that bad. Um, but it ended up being kind of terrible. But the one good thing um, about GameStop after the three and a half years that I spent my life there on 34th Street was um, I, found out about, I found out about this little old app called Instagram. Um, and this, this is the first time that I, I had access to photography. And at the same time, I could create like my father on my own terms and build my own visual house, if you will. Um, I didn't have any kind of experience, but I just know that I could play a lot of video games that I probably could take photos as well too. So I decided to buy a film camera and start taking photos with my iPhone and figure out how that was gonna start going for myself. So I started to really take photos of my family. Like that's a photo of my grandma on the top right. Um, so that's out in Rosedale actually. And taking photos like that, I started to create new family memories and new moments that I began to cherish. And I started to take photos around my neighborhood and really, you know, the, the bottom left photo is actually in, right down the block from my house in uh, Bed-Stuy. Um, I started to do all these different, uh, different little things with photography that gave me the same feeling of family photos and understanding those kind of moments. Um, and then the more that I was on Instagram, I started to notice that people re were reaching out to me to you know, try to hang out to take photos. And I thought that was really weird. I was like, man, I'm not trying to link up with nobody. I know my peoples and I'm straight. But at the same time, um, I try to you know, just step out my shell a little bit and be a little bit you know, uncomfortable with situations. And I started to link up with people like Illich Peters and you know, uh, Jose Silva, Dave Krugman, Raheem Simon. Those became almost like my extended family. And the photo on the top left is when we were in the city and uh, we were on like some kind of Prince of Persia kind of thing. And I was climbing over the roofs and we were all rooftoping and it was all super illegal, don't do that. Um, but those kind of moments are, it's like a new family album for us, you know, it's a new family photos. Um, so I was still working at the game, at GameStop at the time and working at REI, but I was always late to work and I was becoming more and more late to work all the time because I kept on exploring. I started taking more photos with my friends and linking up with people like Joe Cavallini, who was a really close friend of mine, and Carl, I mean, his name is Pierre, sorry, I exposed you, Carl. <laughs> um, but um, all of these different kind of moments just, just started to culminate and started to give you the same feeling that my dad used to, love, how he used to love you know, his job as an electrician. I started to love photography and take it more seriously. I definitely wasn't getting paid anything. I was spending all of my money on film and I, you know, it was just a really rough process, but I was never, I'd never been so happy in my life. Um, I eventually got fired from REI because I was late all the time. 
And um, I told the guy, thank you, because I couldn't do that by myself. And I took a crazy road trip with my, my mom, my sister, and my, and my dad. Um, we drove from Denver to Las Vegas. And then that's when I really, truly embraced photography for the first time. And my persistence finally paid off. Um, I was able to see you know, my family in good health. We've been able to go to Death Valley together. There's my sister thing. She's freezing at the Grand Canyon because none of us had jackets on. I definitely had basketball shorts. Um, this is my dad a couple, a couple of years ago when he was at the peak of his strength. <laughs> um, I don't know why he was doing that pose for, but he's really strong. Um, but just moments like that just became way more special to me. And I just really started to cherish those more and more. Um, and I was take, taking photos in my neighborhood way more often and linking up with more of the Instagram community. And the, when I got fired from REI, like I said, this is the first time I fully be, was able to be free. Um, I was speaking about Raheem Simon, and that's him actually uh, in this abandoned uh, warehouse that we found in Yonkers. And like one of the first days I met him, I had to hop over a 10-foot fence and we fell in a pile of snow that came up to my knees. Um, and then now we've been friends ever since, even though he's from the Bronx. Um, but all of these kind of moments has just been really important for my friends and my life, and it just started to make me feel really comfortable with myself, and I finally found something that I love, which was photography, um, which leads to the third point, which is individuals are greater than algorithms. Um, I think it's really important, especially in the digital real estate, to really establish yourself and be an individual in, this, in, in, this, in that kind of space. Um, it's easy to get caught up in fads, especially with you know, trying to pursue likes and everything like that. And I, I, I typically, not to say that I'm not, I don't fall victim to that game sometimes, but I, I truly hate it because I think it's all about the personality. Um, one of the things I started to notice a lot on Instagram, especially like around 2013, 2012, because I'm, because I'm kind of old, um, there were people writing a lot of inspirational quotes all the time. There are these like, the sun will rise tomorrow and like the grass is greener on the other side. I was like, I do not, adapt. No, not to say there's anything wrong with that, but it was just really sappy and it was not real. And um, you know, I'm born and raised from New York, so I needed to speak from my heart. Um, so I kind of took a Shakespearean approach to looking at my life and my friendships and talking about the things that really you know, meant something to me, like uh, don't front like you wasn't doing the thunderclap. If anybody knows what that is, it's a Jamaican dance move that it, I won't do right now, but I definitely was doing it when I was 18 years old. Um, but being able to connect with people on a way more personal level and not taking my photography so seriously became way more paramount to me rather than trying to be inspirational. I want to be inspirational with my own work and my, my own kind of effort. So at the same time, I created a format called 16 by 9 Vibes. And the whole thing with the 16 9 format was I loved to take cinematic kind of photos and at the same time have the vibes be my captions to relate with my friends and my, and my community. So it never feel like my photography is too serious because I'm always trying to relate to people. Like uh, something, Chinese food, isn't, Chinese food for breakfast is not a good look. That's speaking from experience. Um, <laughs> and I, I should probably still stop doing that myself, honestly. But I wanted to make sure that, that you can, we can connect on that kind of level because it's something that's relatable. You don't have, you can be black, white, Asian, Spanish, or anything, um, but you can understand that kind of feeling and, and kind of silliness and not take something too seriously. Um, while I was doing this the whole time of, you know, creating all this photography and, you know, really getting out there, I had two things to do. I had to establish my name on the internet. Um, so, which my name on the internet is Steve Sweatpants. Um, I'm not wearing sweatpants right now, so I'm a poser. Um, but the whole point of the name, the creation of the Steve Sweatpants is I wanted to have something that I connected with my family and connected with the experiences that I love. And um, I was always thinking about my mom in these kind of situations. And, my mom was always trying to tell me, which, which, she, which she should, like, Stephen, wash the dishes. So my excuse was, um, let me go put these sweatpants on really quick and, uh, and I'll figure it out later. Or when I had to go take out the garbage. In Rosedale, we used to have a lot of possums, um, which was scary when you're taking out the garbage. Um, I would tell my mom, like, let me put these sweatpants on really quick because, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of possums. Um, <laughs> It's what I eventually wanted to create my internet name, I wanted to make sure that I still can have a feeling that I could connect to my mom, and also I wanted to be comfortable, and I want people around me to be comfortable, so I created the name Steve Sweatpants. So all the names, um, so the captions go along with the name, and I want people to be comfortable in general, and I just don't want people to take themselves too seriously. Um, I started to get the attention um, of a couple of Canadians in Vancouver, and I'd never been to Vancouver in my life to the, at that point, um, but it, the rule of thumb, if anything, is you have to be cool with your barber because your barber knows everybody. And my barber is AJ. Um, he's supposed to be here. I don't know where he is, but you know, AJ's <laughs> always, always somewhere. 
Um, but I love him like a brother, and he's always looked out for me, and I used to sweep hair at his barbershop when I was always getting fired from my job. And when he told me about, you know, this guy named Eric wanted to meet me from Vancouver, I was like, oh, cool, sure, let's do it. Um, and little do I know that the next day that I went to hang out with AJ at his, one of his parties, there was this Spanish dude wearing some Japanese shoes, like, oh, those are pretty tight. When I go to see AJ, AJ's like, oh, this is Eric. Um, the next day, which is actually this day that I'm taking photos, um, I walked Eric and his now wife, Celine, um, around Williamsburg. And we walked over the Williamsburg Bridge and we spoke about the concept called Street Dreams Magazine. Um, at first, it was supposed to be just Eric and myself's photo on a digital zine, but I've been linking up with all these people, um, my new form family, um, and we were really doing our thing together as a, uh, as a unit. Like, I've learned photography from Silva. He taught me how to edit. And, and Davis told me to go outside all the time because Davis always outside. And Raheem taught me to be more, more real and you know, appreciate being black. So I wanted to make sure that we incorporated, incorporated these people into the magazine. Um, and that's when we made the first issue of Street Dreams back in 2013. Uh, so this leads to my last point, don't live to pay your rent. So one of the things that my dad always used to tell me all the time um, while I was crying, complaining about you know, paying bills, I was like, why does Con Edison keep on charging me? He was like, well, <laughs> you need to find a job that you actually like. Don't live to pay your rent. And I never understood that when I was younger, but the older I got, as, especially through all the job experiences and being mugged, um, working at, as a custodian, I don't know why, I mean, nothing wrong with that, but you know, I was just doing everything I could, you know, just trying to make ends meet. And when I started doing photography, that's the first time I started to live. Um, I definitely had to sleep on my own couch. You're probably hearing this for the first time, sorry. Um, I had to sleep on my own couch for about 18 months to really pursue my dream. I had to sublet my room in my own apartment to make sure I was able to accommodate and feed myself off of the vision that I really wanted to pursue with not only my own photography career, but with Eric, Mike, and the, my rest of our Street Dreams family. So when I started to do that, I really started to open up my eyes and being able to see the world for the first time um, in all the truest forms, as sappy as that sounds. Uh, you know, I was able to go to Japan for the first time. And, you know, like I mentioned, I love anime. So Cowboy Bebop is one of my favorite shows of all time. Like, My Hero Academia is the truth. So the, the fact that I could go to Japan and really you know, experience Kyoto with, this is the time I was with me and Jess, and we was walking around, and this guy's playing a you know, flute with a little dog, a samurai dog. I was like, this is insane. Um, moments that, you know, being able to go to the next practice facility, um, being able to experience that with a team, and even though they, they trade the players all the time, you know, <laughs> this is still history. You know, they, this dude played on this team at that time, and I was there. Um, the photos, like, even like me at the, taking photos on the subway, which looks like regular mundane photos, which um, now I'm actually f featuring this photo in an exhibition with one of my favorite photographers, Buford Smith, who's uh, an incredible legendary photographer who I have no, bu uh, no business being with. But and through photography and being able to tell these stories, I'm, I'm able to create new family moments. Uh, being able to go to Cuba, being able to go to Thailand with uh, Jess and her mom, and thank God Jess' mom was there because she's Thai, or she speaks Thai. Um, it would have been really rough for us. And even taking a photo like this with uh, the brother with a do-rag and the baby, um, it, that, that photo means a lot to me, especially this year. Um, uh, last year, my dad um, suffered four strokes, and um, he was on the top of his game, and he still is. He's still as stubborn as ever, but you know, it definitely changed the dynamic of our family a lot. So being able to shoot a photo like this during our Nike event, um, I ran up to this guy. He's like, man, I need to get a photo of you. Um, and, it made me feel, and it makes me feel like the same kind of feeling that you know, when I used to hang out with my dad and him you know, holding my foot <laughs> while I'm shoveling in the middle of that backyard. Um, it's the same kind of feeling that I felt, and um, it's really important for me to do that. And being able to work with Kevin Durant and ask him to come to the Knicks and him telling me no in my face, you know, all that stuff is, all that stuff is timeless kind of moments. Uh, I used to write Slick Rick rhymes um, on Hot 97 on, off my tape cassette and rewinding it back and forth. And if you ever watched the French Montana and Slick Rick video, I mean, and Drake video, I'm actually in the video taking photos. And then I'm, I get to use this photo in, in the gallery two nights ago. So all my world is, became full circle. And, fully encompassing all of these moments in my life um, has been a complete blessing. Uh, one of the coolest things that I got to uh, do recently um, is me, Jess, and one of my other friends actually, uh, we got to see a sumo match in Japan. And I grew up playing Street Fighter. Like, E Honda was the best player or a Street Fighter. Um, so being able to actually witness a sumo match and feel the energy and understand that and able to share a story like that, especially being from Jamaica, Queens, um, is really important for me because this is the new age of storytelling. And I look at these like a modern age folk tales. Um, so this is the, officially the six-year Street Dreams 
Uh, we've been able to work with incredible photographers like Joseph Rodriguez, which I look at as like my big uncle right now, especially with my father having a stroke and everything. And Joseph Rodriguez has become one of my mentors and or somebody who I really look up to. And um, being able to be featured in the New York Times, even though I barely graduated high school and <laughs> I was a, a college dropout and definitely stay in school. Um, this was, being in the New York Times is like my college diploma, uh, my college degree, I don't know what it's called. Um, <laughs> but I, I got one. And so, but I guess what it all culminates to is that um, I feel like there's four things that's really important in your life that you need to do, which is chase immortality, be precisely persistent, um, remember that individuals are greater than algorithms, and don't live to pay your rent. So that's it. Thank you.